This one is all about boids, and every coder at some stage is going to code this up. What I've ended up with is an implementation which allows me to scale the components that lead to boid behavior, and I've got multiple flocks or swarms of them in the same space, mostly ignoring each other and going about doing their own thing. Now, when I started this, I did what everybody does and looked at what others had done before me. And I came across this very nice implementation, which has multiple swarms of boids, again, mostly ignoring each other, but not quite. In here is a predator boid group, which chases after the others, running them down, diving into the middle of other groups, splitting them up and so on, much like you'd see a seal playing with a school of fish. This setup was the basis for steering my own end result. I wanted different groups, predators, obstacle avoidance, perching, wind or current deviations, and so on. But this implementation also comes with a 3D option, coded from scratch based on the coordinate system transformation options and 3D to 2D projection information from a website listed in the code. And when you switch it on and expose the third dimension to the boids, well, off they go and explore. This gives other options to the predators and you can see them stretching off into a long line as they give chase and continue to dive into the middle of the other groups. And of course the rules are well documented and all behavior is governed by the separation, alignment and cohesion rule base that you can find on the website listed in the description. Something rather remarkable occurs in this run of the game. The predators eventually trap their prey by encircling them. The prey boys are happy so long as they can stay together in their group. This behavior all emerges from the three basic rules. There's no intelligence here, no fitness function, no rewards based rule behavior. Though it's quite remarkable that this type of steady state can emerge. And over here, another group has been shepherded back and forth by another Boyd. Quite happy to do so, as long as they can stay together. But to make a start, I jumped onto the Ben Eater website, where there is a Java version running that you can mess about with. I'll add a link in the description. You can play around with the coherence, separation and alignment inputs and see what the impact is going to be on the boids. Too much coherence with no separation and they group into tight balls, vice versa, and they'll tend to fly away from each other. Scrolling down on this website and you'll see suggestions for adding other dimensions to this, both literally by suggesting to extend the code to include a third component and also by including a predator into the mix as well. The code for setting this up is very simple, which I like well documented and only about 100 lines long. So I decided to use it to steer my own development, which resulted in this. And it only took about an hour to complete. So here's what I did. The main game loop in the code repeatedly loops through the coherent separation and alignment functions in the code, which determine the next position of each void and then draws the array of voids on the screen. But before that, it initializes them. So let's start there. A void is nothing more than a point on the screen you can draw fancy shapes around that point to make it look like a bird or whatever, but it's just a point which needs an X and Y coordinate. So we use a data type to store this and an array to store our voids. Their initial coordinates are randomly generated. And if I draw one on screen and pop a circle around it, you get this. That's a void. And there's the rest of them. They also have a delta X and delta Y value attached to them, which determines how far along the X and Y axis they'll move on each game loop. So if I randomly generate those as well, when the boys are initialized and set it running, you get this. Straight away, you have a problem. All the boys fly off the screen. So we need a way to make them turn back when they approach the boundary. In the code, this function is called keep within bounds, and it looks like this. So if a boy gets within 200 pixels of the edge, it's forced to turn in the opposite direction, and the turn factor listed is set to one. Here's how it works. In the example shown, a boy is approaching the left boundary with a delta x of minus 5, 0, 0 is in the top left of the screen, and the delta y is minus 2. So that means it's going to go left 5 pixels and up 2 pixels on each frame. When it gets closer than the margin allows, represented here by the green line, the delta x is going to have a plus 1 added to it on each frame. As the frames go by, this will result in it slowly turning to the right, until it exits the margin zone. Once that happens, its delta x and delta y won't change anymore. They have no reason to at the moment, and the void will continue on its merry way. When I code up and implement those few lines, you get this. 
seems to be working just fine. If I zoom in on the left boundary, you can see the voids slow down and turn as described. A correction is also applied to the top and bottom and right boundaries to keep the voids on screen. And I use a margin of 50 and a turn factor of 3 to get them to turn a bit quicker. Next up is the coherence function, labelled here as fly towards the centre because, well, that's what it does. It encourages all voids to fly towards the average position of all nearby voids, causing them to clump together. In this case, nearby is fixed at a distance of 75 pixels from the void in question. In the example shown, I've drawn an arc to represent this, and the void will check all other voids in the array to see if they fall within the limit. They do this by checking how far apart they are on the x and y axes, and use good old Pythagoras to get the actual distance in pixels. Here we have one void outside the limit, and three within it. When it finds a void within the limit, it makes a note of both its x and y values, and adds it to others that it's found, and then divides by the total number found to get an average x and y location for all neighbouring voids. And that's the spot that it wants to move to, so it updates its delta x and y values, and on the next animation frame, it'll update its position to move directly there. And when we do that for all voids, we get this. So far so good, but again we seem to have a problem. Checking the code I see that there is a centering factor mentioned which acts as a scaling function to limit the maximum distance a void will travel on any one frame as a result of this coherence centering calculation. It's set at just a half of 1% and gets applied to both the calculated delta x and delta y. I've decided to add a slider to my code so I can adjust this on the fly and it scales it by between 1 and 50%. This has certainly helped to calm things down, but you'll still find some voids tending to jump further than you'd want them to on each frame. So a global speed limit function is included, which has the final say in how fast a void can move. It works by checking how far the void will move if left to its own devices, that's the green line here, and compares that to the speed limit. If it's too large, as it is in the example shown, then both the delta x and y will need to be scaled back, as the speed limit is just 15. The method shown here doesn't change the direction of the void, just the distance it'll travel, which is important, otherwise they'd never converge. I've used another slider for the speed limit, so I can adjust and play around with different values, and it seems to have done the trick. Separation is next, or avoid others as it's labelled here, and again there's a minimum distance before its influence is felt. This is normally a lot less than the visible range, as you'd want the voids to be close to their neighbours for the protection flocking gives, but not too close, so as to avoid crashing into each other. Again it works by seeing which of the voids are within the minimum distance, calculates how far away it is along both the x and y axes, and adds up those values. Those are labelled as move x and move y in the code sample, and when all voids have been checked, the move values are again scaled, and added to the voids existing delta x and y. When this is combined with the coherence influence, you get the following. And finally, it's the alignment component. Here it's labelled match velocity, and it does just that. It uses the visible range metric, the same as the coherence function, to identify the voids it should be acting upon, and finds their average delta x and delta y. These are again scaled and added to the voids existing, delta x and y. So it's fly towards the centre, avoid others, match velocity, limit speed and keep within bounds. All those can have an impact on a void's delta x and y. So next it's update the void's actual x and y by adding on the deltas and then drawing it on screen. For now I've left it as a circle, but I've added a line going from the centre to its next position as a bit of a visual clue for alignment. Its length will dynamically adjust depending on its velocity. Predators and object avoidance will have to wait until next time. And as always, thanks for watching.